So a truck could go from uh, Nashville to LA on the rails with the driver, with the tractor, the whole thing autonomously. So instead of having all these autonomous vehicles on our highways with cars, they'd be on these rails instead of forming trains, you know, taking two or three days to get the thing. Freight starts moving immediately. They hook up a, a rail car with a power unit and it's autonomously on its way. Welcome to Life of the Mile delivered by Freightworks, one of America's fastest growing podcasts actually produced by truck. Be guided to tell stories. Compelling driver stories. I need to do something big. Insight drivers like life is true. Steam drivers are actually safer drivers. All here, right now. This is Life by the Mile, delivered by Freightworks. I'm your host, Butch Malpe, and it is a delight. You know, we try to bring you a variety of guests, and today I know we're going to have a very eclectic and interesting conversation. Uh, I'm with Bob Rutherford. Uh, he, uh, his Twitter page, by the way, go go to that. It, it describes him as a truck stop philosopher, activist writer, student of history, predictive maintenance manifesto for the trucking industry, which is a great description. And then beyond that, what, what I loved is hearing that he's a 50-year he's a veteran of the trucking industry, so he can bring in a lot of history and perspective along the way. His contributions to the industry have been recognized, among others, by the American Trucking Association Technology and Maintenance Council. They have the silver spark plug for technical excellence and a recognized associate award for supporting the organization's membership committee. Bob, welcome. We're really grateful to have you. I'm glad to be here. Well, let me let me start out by asking the question that I, I really wanted to ask. What is a truck stop philosopher? Uh, basically an ex-salesman. Uh, I used to sell uh, seats for national seating. I've sold uh, turbochargers back in the day when uh, most of the engines were naturally aspirated. Uh I'm 75 years old, went into retirement, then went into semi-retirement, and uh, I just don't try to sell anybody anything. I just try to educate them, which is one reason I became a member of the TMC. Me and a couple of associates decided that an educated customer was so much more fun to deal with than somebody that didn't have a clue of how all the systems on the truck integrated, supposed to work together, and Probably the product that had the most impact on my life was the fan clutch because it intersected not only with cooling the engine, but then as time progressed and they added the air conditioning condensers. I mean, the student of history, I mean, when I started with a fan clutch, it had one thermal switch and mm. a solenoid mm. and the clutching mechanism. Then they added the uh, uh, air conditioning condenser in front of it. So that needed a switch to turn it on, otherwise it wouldn't come on. Then they added the charge air cooler. And that, uh, you know, first came on without any sensors on it. And then they said, well, damn, you know, if we're going to try to charge the air and cool it, we need a way to turn the fan on when there's not enough airflow to cool that. Then transmission coolers came involved. Then the poor fan clutch, it operates by air. So you get... 60 psi because of an air leak because somebody at the factory an engineer decided i think i'll just run the airline right next to a 1500 degree turbocharger mm. and let's see how that plastic and rubber hose holds up to 1500 degrees well, i can tell you from firsthand experience it'll go almost exactly 138 to 140,000 miles before it deteriorates and has an air leak i mean that's a funny way to do uh, science experiments on real trucks trying to deliver freight. <laughs> so, and then uh, the solenoid that controls the air is controlled by electricity. So a loose ground wire raises havoc with the uh, right. uh, electronic mechanism. So, that, you know, there, there's, there's tw 20 different ways to kill a fan clutch. And guess what? Every mechanic said every time a fan clutch failed, bad Japanese bearings, or then it turned out to be Chinese bearings. It was always bad bearings. Well, the bearings would have never failed if they hadn't overheated because the clutch was slipping. Right. You slip the clutch, generate heat, degrees. So anyway, that's that's why I'm a philosopher instead of a salesman. But you know what's interesting? And, from, and, and every day there's more problems to solve, you know. <laughs> right, right. But what's interesting about that is, Bob, it seems that you were able to uh, diagnose what was really going on there. And so often, 
I guess from a production standpoint, when you look at OEMs, you, you that there's not always an end user in mind. Maybe they're better than they used to be. I I, I don't know. What do, what do you think? I, what, what is there more of a driver centric approach by OEMs these days? Well, you know, in 50 years, I worked for a lot of manufacturers, and a lot of manufacturers would go through changes. A good example is national seating. When I started with national seating, <clears throat> they defined the customer as the truck driver. We want to have the best seat, and, and there's unfortunately two kinds of people that buy truck seats. The guy that never rides in a truck seat the VP of maintenance or the president of the company hardly ever rides in the in the truck seat, and then the guy that runs in the that, that actually rides in the seat. So you want to know who pays a thousand dollars for a seat? The guy riding in the seat. Uh, then so you define the driver, and then who who the drivers work for? The fleets. So we had a big what's called fleet pull through at National Seating back in the day, and uh, I'd call on the fleet guy, and in fact I, I'm printed up a little joke business card and it said I'm here to sell you something you can't buy yet and it was tomorrow's seat mm. so I try to get a fleet uh, in fact one of my star examples in fact I just read about them they, they lost money for some reason this past quarter but the uh, U.S. Express I mean they top top of the line seats spec them you know we want our drivers to uh, you couldn't add, there was no other bells and whistles to add to the seat. So I sold, you know, that, that was my claim to glory back in the uh, uh, late 90s, early 2000s, was I sold top-of-the-line seats to U.S. Express. That is great. Well, then, like so many corporations, say what? That's great. So, I feel like I'm doing all the talking here. <laughs> I, that's, no, that's so, okay. uh, anyway, so, uh Anyway, that company gets bought out by a corporation. In fact, uh, Transport Topics has a big story, mergers and acquisitions. So anyway, I ended up getting fired because the company decided that the real customer in their hearts and soul are the OEM truck builders. So what are we doing with fleet salesmen just running around? And in fact, fleet guys like Bob Rutherford, he gives away parts for warranty. He gives away demo seats. Uh, Bob Rutherford is, quote-unquote, a giveaway artist. We need sales guys that can call on truck dealers. So they got rid of me and hired guys that call on truck dealers. And uh, I don't know where they're at now. I don't follow them because I'm a truck stop philosopher, and it's not part of my philosophy. So, uh, But anyway, stuff like that happens in business. Bob, let, let, me, let me ask you this. When you look back at uh, the industry, and we'll talk about looking forward in a minute here, but when you look back, what are the most dramatic changes that you've seen over the 50 years? I mean, paint with a mop. You don't have to paint in detail. But what are what are the biggest changes that you've seen occurring through the years? Well, the whole concept of whether there's a truck driver shortage or not. You know, I've got a bit of an engineering background. I was an industrial engineer. And I'm the kind of person that it's either black or white. There's either a shortage of drivers or there's not. And, uh, you know, the ATA, and I think the trucking industry is a whole lot more political today than it was in the past. You have the ATA saying we need 80,000 more drivers. And the uh, OIDA people, Owner Operators Independent Drivers Association, is saying, uh, you know, we got a retention problem, we got a pay problem. And in my uh, theory of the case, is I've studied uh, economics and politics in college, is uh, if there's really a driver shortage, wages would be going up, right. complaints would be going right. down. Uh, every receiver, if you want to get your goods, you better have a nice, clean, well maintained bathroom for the truck drivers, or guess what? You're not getting your freight. Well, apparently there's not a truck driver shortage because truck drivers are abused. I mean, it, uh, you know, a lot of my job was uh, I'd, I'd live at a dealership. I live at a fleet. I'd be in the driver's lounge teaching the drivers about seats. I'd be teaching mechanics about fan clutches. And, uh, you know, I hang out at uh, Ward International, one of my favorite places in the whole wide okay. world in Mobile, Alabama. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, great people. 
So I'm, you know, I'm training three shifts of mechanics, training the parts people. And, uh, you know, I'm like a fly on the wall. I see everything that goes on, how every truck driver is treated. And they treated theirs outstanding, great accommodations for the drivers. And then I'd be in other places, you know, they're making the drivers wait. The driver needs going to stay overnight, call a taxi to get to the hotel two miles away. At Ward International, you know, they'd cater in lunch if they had a bunch of drivers waiting on mm-hmm. trucks. And uh, uh, other places, it's like, uh, there's the vending machine. Good luck. Right. <laughs> and in some parts of the world, you don't want to live out, out of a vending machine. Exactly. So. Bob, you know, when when you look at the marketing for, for truck, and by the way, I, what I love is being able to tap into five decades of wisdom about this. When you look at the marketing for most trucking and logistics companies they talk about pay safety we care about you you're not just a number home time they're all using the same language what is it that really distinguishes some companies from others because you know one of the things we're trying to do here at Freightworks is is to be a company that's consistent in its values make good on its promises and we're not perfect but we're committed to get better what do you find about the companies that are really good (laughs) <laughs> they don't lie to the recruits as they're trying to recruit them. I mean, brutal honesty is the best way to go. And uh, like I said, being a fly on the wall in dealerships, mm-hmm. I have seen drivers. I mean, the guy just started with the company, right? He needs $300 worth of work done. Okay. It takes breakdown four hours to call the dealership back to authorize a $300 repair. I mean, it's, it's a waste of the guy's time. You know, keep your drivers on the road, you know, get, consider it a, a cost of business. Let's say it was, uh, you know, it, it probably took whoever was running breakdown five minutes to do mm-hmm. the paperwork and make the approval. But you make the poor driver wait four hours and then they, they're going to bitch at him when he misses his uh, delivery window. And then uh, he they, they reschedule it and he gets there. He's busting to use the bathroom and uh, no drivers right. allowed in right. the bathroom. Right. I mean... In fact, if I was a trucking company, I assume you guys are a trucking we, company, we are, right? Yeah. Trying to recruit drivers. Yeah. You know, I wouldn't haul freight for anybody that abuses my drivers. If you if if my guy can't get there and use the bathroom, have some other facilities, maybe instead of having to sleep in the sleeper, you have a little break room set up. In fact, one of my jobs in my past, I just rake people over the coals on our shipping dock. If I saw them abuse a driver, and it's like sport for some of these guys on the shipping docks, you know. In fact, in the parts business and service business, you know, trying to rip off an owner-operator is some of the the biggest joy that some people get out of life in this business. And uh, I never worked for such an organization, but I've been in them, you know, training uh, mechanics, training drivers. And, uh, uh, And then, you know, until I retired, until I got out of the sales game and become a philosopher, I couldn't talk about it because there, there's rules in sales, right? You don't bite the hand that feeds you. Right, right. That's for sure. And Bob, look, look look at all the money you made in trucking, Bob. Now you're going to say these guys are a bunch of jerks. Yep. Now you can't say that as a salesman. <laughs> right. But the thing, Bob, that is really important is that I, I think in your in your role, because you've been in so many different sectors and you've there's been the consistency of five decades, you're able to be a little more prophetic. I mean, to point out these are systemic problems that we have that we've got to deal with. And I know here at Freightworks, we get drivers that come in from other companies. And it's not to say that our company is perfect, but we get drivers that come in and they are so beat up, Bob. They've been lied to so much. They've been abused so much. They've been told they're a commodity. They're just a number. They could be moved around and monetized and commoditized. It takes a while for them to kick the tires and see we're going to be truthful in what we say. So I think what you're saying is really, really important. Yeah. And I think uh, for fleets of the future, telematics, in fact, I wrote an article related to a a secure truck stop parking. And uh, I mentioned uh, two companies, Tangerine uh, Artificial Intelligence, that I'm doing research and development projects with at uh, Auburn University. In fact, uh, because of my fan clutch background, Auburn has been able to uh, get a patent applied for 
on using artificial intelligence to monitor the fan clutch so it never fails. Mm. Now, that's a great selling point for recruiting a driver. Say, look, we'll know of a truck problem before you know about it. In fact, we had an instance where we had knew a component was going to fail, called the uh, shop, and, uh, you know, supply chain issues. You can't get parts nowadays. So uh, they were able to get the parts on faith two weeks in advance before the part mm. failed. When it finally failed, the part was ready. They scheduled the truck in. No one scheduled maintenance. So, uh, you know, having a, a full slate of telematics and uh, – one of the things that I proposed in an article, and when I write articles, I write about the future. Right. So I wrote, I wrote, I wrote an article saying uh, I've got a new way of writing, and because uh, Ten Street and uh, Tangerine, everybody wants permission to use their name in a magazine article. Like you guys, if, if I do a follow-up mm -hmm. article on this conversation, right. uh, oh, we we want we want to see your your article. Well, I don't do that. I'm I'm writing about the future, and you know, it's uh, I'm not saying this is how you are or what you are, but this is what my suggestion is about the future. So anyway, talking about uh, truck parking, you know, I have a vision of when trucks are being tracked, like each one of your trucks, and and especially fleets reaching out to owner operators, because a lot of them you get in a capacity bind, you'll lease on temporary owner operators. Say, hey, we're going to give you this whole telematic suite. We're going to track you. We're going to have a database of unsafe parking mm. areas. You know, not not truck stops and things like that. But you know, is it safe to park near this receiver that you're going to? And then if it the guy's run out of hours or he's just too fatigued to go find a safer spot to park because he's he's being warned through an app that, hey, this is not the best place to park. Then the system would have a database of law enforcement. Uh, I'm sure you got you got safety and security mm -hmm. people on your mm -hmm. payroll. Someone like you, you sign up through the app and say, if an owner operator or any trucker from any company, we got safety and security people, you let us know through the app where they're at. And uh, there's a schedule that uh, our company will be there at three o'clock in the morning to make sure everything's fine. And I figure for law enforcement, you know, because uh, I've done some work in freight security, okay. you don't have to come up with a, you don't have to come up with a bait truck. Okay. We, this guy is automatically on his own, not wanting to, but he's becoming bait for thieves for, you know, exactly. something bad. So, so set, so official law enforcement set up on this truck and see if the bait's taken any time that evening. You know, you save two or three lives a year. It might be worth I, the I trouble. I love it. It's business fiction, isn't it? Yeah, that's what I, I couldn't think of. It. I, <laughs> I wrote it, but I can speculative business fiction. I know. Fiction. I read it in here. You, the so, the pre-notes pre uh, on, on this uh, interview were extremely helpful. This is uh, Bob Rutherford. He's a truck stop <laughs> philosopher, among other things, an activist writer. You're right for CCJ, which is great. L let me ask. Let me ask you this. I'm going to ask you to be a prognosticator and look up around the corner. What does? Is that like a yeah, trouble? Maker? Well, it could be. <laughs> you know what? Uh, creative minds are rarely tidy, and sometimes you got to hit the hornet's nest, don't you, Bob? So let me ask yeah. you. Well, like John John Lewis said, uh, uh, get in some good trouble. Well, and 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 somehow <laughs> viscerally, I get the sense that you've done that before, but. You've, brought, you've taken from it experiences that are so helpful to hear. I want you to look up around the corner and tell me, what does the trucking and logistics industry look like in 2040? 2040. I wish you would have given me a heads up. That I don't look that far into the future. Well, let, let's but, uh, 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 back it back. Just tell us oh. where, you know, tell us where you see us headed. Okay. This is way out there. In fact, uh, I'm, I'm recalling an a, uh, article I wrote for uh, Transport Topics on this. I live in a small town in Tennessee. It used to be a small Franklin. town. Uh, we got, yep, we got railroad tracks. Three o'clock in the morning. You can hear the train. The train's coming. They're blowing their horn. 
you know, I've never seen maybe in five years a train on the tracks two or three times. And I think if you're going to have autonomous vehicles, it'd be very easy. In fact, uh, trains themselves, you know, they, they put down 50 cars, 100 cars to form a train. Uh, a guy contacted me. He found my uh, uh, transport topics article. And he said, Bob, we're doing what you predicted in the future instead of trucks, each truck being loaded onto a, a platform and having its own power unit. So a truck could go from uh, Nashville to L.A. on the rails with the driver, with the tractor, the whole thing autonomously with a 50 horsepower turbine engine powering a flatbed with a tractor trailer and driver. And the power unit that's 50 horsepower could also have sleeping accommodations much better than a truck. So instead of having all these autonomous vehicles on our highways with cars, they'd be on these rails. That's, you know, every all your listeners, every time you see a train track, how many trains you see that on the track? That is so interesting. Now imagine. That is so interesting, yeah. Bob. I so anyway, the, this... Well, this guy in Western Canada contacted me, and he said, Bob, we're experimenting with that right now. We got 50, and I predicted the 50 horsepower because I knew 5,000 horsepower for uh, um, 100 cars is about what it would take. Uh, and they're doing it instead of forming trains, you know, taking two or three days to get the thing. Freight starts moving immediately. They hook up a, a rail car with a power unit. And it's autonomously on its way. Why, you know, screw around with 5,000 horsepower and uh, waiting to put 100 cars I, Bob, together? I think that is so very, I, I, I think that's very interesting. You know, it's an aside, but uh, the billionaire Phil Anschutz years ago saw the rail lines and said to himself, those unused rail lines, many places around the country, particularly in the West, would be great for me to lease and I'll go ahead and put fiber optics down where they are. And that's how Phil Anschutz became a billionaire. So thinking outside the box like that is so, so interesting. That, I, I love that. I love that concept. And, yeah. and what, uh, let, me, let me ask you uh, this. When you look back at the whole sales process uh, in, your, in your life, you obviously were born with those gifts. Do you remember the first thing you sold? Actually, I sold, uh, I worked for Fleet Guard Filters uh, as a young industrial engineer, and they were building a 100,000 square foot additional warehouse. They started with a factory and a small warehouse, and then everything took off. So they needed to do this 100,000 100 square foot warehouse. And as an industrial engineer, very few people had uh, material handling experience. And uh, I, out of all the ones that had none, I had a little bit more than most. So uh, they said, we want you to design a warehouse and we're going to, you know, think in a, a special uh, uh, in-floor tow lines instead of lift, uh, lift trucks, uh, different kinds of palleting, uh, flow, flow conveyors, a lot of conveyors. So we want you to design this. And I said, uh, well, there's a... Uh, a trade show coming up in Cal Palace in San Francisco, California in 1971, I believe it was. And I said, uh, authorize my travel to this uh, material handling trade show. And they said, engineers don't travel, salespeople travel. You know what? I said, well, look, I'm going to go to the trade show if you want me to do this. Otherwise, that's the first time I almost got fired. Otherwise, I'm not going to do the project. If I can't go to a trade show on material handling and you want me by about an estimated quarter million dollar mm -hmm. budget of equipment, uh, I'm not going to do it. And they said, well, okay, I guess there's always a first for somebody. So off I went to a trade show, spent three or four mm -hmm. days there. And uh, basically, I, you know, visit the booths I was interested in. And there's always two or three booths for the same item. So I'd listen to the salesman, take copious notes and I started making notes like, you know, this guy shouldn't have said this. This, you know, this ain't going to convince me to buy his product. So I started comparing salesmen and said, well, you know, if the day ever comes, I got to be a salesman. Uh, I'll do the good stuff and leave out the bad stuff. So uh, then then I get back and I put my proposal together and then they pop a big surprise on me. 
on me. You can say, Bob, you got to go to the um, Appropriations oh, Committee okay. in uh, Columbus, Indiana, yeah. and convince them to give us the quarter million dollars. So anyway, I, I first big major presentation in front of about a dozen people, and some of them had the unofficial title of sharpshooter. Their whole point was to shoot you right. down and make you go right. home. Because nobody gets gets a quarter million dollars from right. Cummins to, to do this on the first try. So anyway, I was prepared. I had all the, uh, I, I covered a lot of objections in my presentation, which I had uh, studied up a little bit about uh, a sales technique. Don't wait for the objection. Cover it in the mm -hmm. presentation so they can't object to it. And then have alternatives because there will be objections. So uh, basically... I got uh, the the money and a voice in the back of the room, which I didn't recognize. I, you know, they introduced a dozen people, and I didn't take notes and get business cards. He said, "We don't need a young whippersnapper like you hustling us for this kind of money." Oh, was that a compliment or an insult? You know. So two weeks later, the uh, national sales manager called me up and said, uh, according to the uh, guy in charge of logistics and distribution. He said, uh, you want to be a salesman? And I said, I never told anybody that. So it all started. So, I, so anyway, they had me go to Dallas, Texas. I was about 24, 25 years old then. And uh, they offered me a sales job, a nice expense account. Uh, they wanted you to in entertain the customers, develop rapport. Mm -hmm. Uh, customers in those days were uh, the Cummins distributors and uh, air travel card. And this is back before 9-11. I mean, there, nobody was ever in a middle seat. And uh, whining and dining customers right. of rental cars, always get a nice fancy rental right. car. Uh, 24 years old. And I, I, I did what a lot of people wait till the 65 to do, travel the south southwest mm -hmm. uh, i had uh, las vegas in my territory mm -hmm. uh el paso texas all of southern california new mexico so that's, uh, that's how i got in sales and i said man why why would i ever want to work for a living i'll just stay in sales so that's what you i know, did bob uh, the mark of great conversations i often say this is that they start to come to an end we got three minutes left here this is bob rutherford uh, i love the moniker truck stop philosopher there are a lot of things that can be said about your background, but that is a great umbrella for all the things that uh, we've been touching on here today. He's an activist writer. Best way for people to reach you is how? Uh, Google or join LinkedIn if you're not on LinkedIn and uh, look up Bob Rutherford. And uh, actually, Bob Rutherford number one. I was one of the first Bob Rutherfords on uh, LinkedIn. But uh, due to my activity and my writing, uh, I'm usually the uh, first name to, to pop up there. Great. That's a, a great place so. to, to find them. And you know what? You didn't know this when you uh, jumped on board here, but we actually give a gift. To, so we're going to need to get your address here after. Another surprise. Another surprise. <laughs> so now I get to be like an infomercial with QVC, and I get to tell you what prize you get to pick. So the first option here is a, uh, this went over really well at Matt's. It's got that red, white, and blue on the back of the cap. It's got the leather right. Life by the Mile insignia there. That's option number one. Option number two, Bob, is a genuine Yeti mug. You've got the Freightworks One logo. you got the Life by the Mile mo logo. Of course, Yeti is its own culture. And then we've got yep. another cap option, which is the Freightworks One logo. Of course, this is Freightworks sponsoring Life by the Mile. And so, which of those would you like? Uh, number one, the one with the red, white, and You know blue. what? This just went over gangbusters at, at Matt's. And that was my first Matt's, by the way. That was quite the experience. But we will get your address. If you send that to us, we'll send this along to you. And, and Bob, I, okay. I knew when I read through the article that you forwarded, pre-publication, and a little description about you, that you were going to be colorful, interesting, informed, and have some historic perspective that would be valuable. You, you've been unlike it, really any of the guests that we've had so far, and I'm really grateful, and I hope we could do this again. Well, like I warned you on the uh, beginning that uh, I've done one other podcast, and the uh, host said, let's change subjects before we alienate the entire audience. 
and that didn't happen this time. So I guess I'm making well, progress. Well, either that <laughs> and or we might be a good team together. I'm not quite sure. But from Franklin, Tennessee, here in Rutherfordton, North Carolina, right in the foothills of the Appalachian Mountains, uh, this is Life of the Mile delivered by FreightWorks. I'm your host, Butch Malpe. Make sure you hit the subscribe button, get the notifications, that bell, engage, like, share, and help build the Life by the Mile community so that we can have more guests like Bob Rutherford on today. We thank you so much. Thanks for watching this episode. You know, Life by the Mile delivered by FreightWorks is one of the newest, largest, and fastest growing podcasts actually produced by a trucking company. Now, we want you to like and share this episode. If you'd like to see more episodes, click here. And make sure that you subscribe to this channel by clicking here. We'll see you there.